Good morning. Man, I was trying to get the tears out. <laughs> he always gets me. I was trying to get him out before I came up, but he always has a plan. <laughs> so, praise God. Uh, we love him. He loves us. We belong to him solely on what Jesus Christ has done for us. So I know this, that there's nothing that compared to, can compare to God and his word. And he gives this word to us to govern our lives with full authority so that we could see him the way we ought to see him. And I'm a testimony this morning that God truly uses the weak things. He really, he really does use the foolish things. And uh, I know I'm nothing without Christ. And so would you journey with me this morning as we go through Psalms chapter 27? If you would turn there and we'll read our text this morning. Psalm 27. The top of my Bible says, a psalm of fearless trust in God. It reads like this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers come, came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And I will offer his tent sacrifices in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Verse 7, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me. When thou didst say, seek my face, my heart said to thee, thy face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide thy face from me. Do not turn thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Do not abandon me, nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path. Because of my foes, do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries, for false witness have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. In the land of the living, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we get to gaze upon the beauty of your son, Jesus Christ. We get to go into this tabernacle through his precious blood. And what the blood of no animal could do, your son did once and for all. We thank you for your word, Lord, that explains and shows us how to trust you through hard times, 
We go through things, Lord, that cause us to possibly frown and be mad at you and question you. And yet you're so faithful, God. So would you, God, this morning protect your word from any error because it's perfect. May you show us, God, whom to look to when troubled times come. We love you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's message will have the theme of having confidence in God during hard times. And I realize that this term, hard times, is very broad. So let me begin right away by saying that what I'm referring to this morning by having hard times is anything that you face that causes you to have full acceptance on God to get you through. Those are hard times. In other words, having no control of whatever you're going through, those are especially hard times. And as children of God, he calls us to come to him as we go through these hard times. And although it's true that at all times we are dependent on God for everything, there are certain seasons in life that God allows and he ordains that really make it evident to the child of God that we will have to trust him and to be dependent on everything. We may not always agree with what he wants, but he knows what's best. And although these seasons are never fun, they are continually, I'm sorry, they are certainly crucial and necessary for us, especially if we are to understand the sovereignty of God as he rules over anything, over everything. Trust me, they're not fun times. I've never seen anybody sign up for hard times. I've never seen anybody say, I can't wait to go through the fire. As a matter of fact, these seasons can hurt, and they can cause you to have to learn patience. They can cause you to feel different emotions towards God as you disagree with what he's doing. They can cause you to even be angry at times. Frustration. They can cause adult tantrums. Anybody ever have one of those? You're lucky that they're... <laughs> Embarrassing. Sometimes I'm glad that there's no video cameras. Or only God sees, right? I remember one time I threw a dollar tantrum. I was working on a 12-story building. I was chasing three-eighths of an inch of 12 stories. And man, I'm, I'm surprised my hammer still is in one piece. Not because of anything God was taking me through, but just because I had, was, was very just upset. They caused pain. Sometimes they cause sleepless nights. And they cause us to ask questions like, what did I do to deserve this? Or why me? Or what could have I done different on my end to have avoided it? what I'm going through right now. And so to learn to be at peace at God, with God, with whatever he's telling us that we're going through can be hard sometimes. We begin to analyze or even overanalyze, as well as many other experiences not even mentioned right now. And you may have gone through tough times. You may have looked at God and asked, this is not fair, or told him, this is not fair. These hard times can be described by terms in the word like pressure, afflictions, trials, tribulation, trouble, persecution, anguish, being burdened, having adversary, adversity, going through the storm, going through the fire. You see, everyone has tough times. Nobody's exempt from them the unbeliever as well as the believers. And even Christ himself, who was 100% man, did not take any shortcuts from the flesh, but he had to be made like his brethren in all things. And as we look at Christ, we have to consider the cross. And as you consider the cross, 
in comparison to any hard time that you ever faced, it will put in perspective of what you go through and what Christ has done for us. See, both the sons of God and the sons of the world know that troubled times come. But the question is, is how do each handle their troubles? How do they handle the troubles? As a child of God, you are bound to your God. As a child of the, the, the devil, there's frustration because they have no idea what's going on. You see, the sons of the world prepare for troubles very differently than the sons of God. Even as a child and as an adolescent, I remember some of the things that I was taught indirectly or directly to prepare me to persevere through the hard times that I would face that would come later on in life. I remember like the posters that you would see as a kid hanging there in his little kitten hanging on the, the yarn, or the never give up, and it was the frog with his head in, in, inside of the beak of the pelican and his hands reaching around, grabbing the, the stork's throat. Never give up. Slogans like tough times don't last, but tough people do. Or the world was here first, it owes you nothing. Search up persevering quotes Or books, you won't be disappointed. There's hundreds. Just look under images when you Google them. And you'll see all kinds of things that will will inspire you to get what you got to go through. And even being in sports and conditioning is very hard. Wanting to give up. Coaches yell, don't you quit on me. You have to believe in yourself. This is nothing compared to what you're going to go through. Where is your heart? And just as you're conditioning, you're running, getting ready to throw in the towel for a water break or listen to your body cramps, they would play the radio. The Rocky theme would come on. <laughs> bum, bum, ba, ba, bum, ba, ba, bum, ba, ba, bum. All of a sudden, the inner Balboa would come out. <laughs> the inner inspiration. You think you're Balboa running through Philadelphia? You don't want to give up. You want to rock everyone like a hurricane. Don't look at me like that because everybody has their cheesy inspiration songs. (laughs) Boot camps prepare soldiers for war. Training camps prepare athletes for fights or seasons. Internships prepare possible team members with the lousiest tasks so they can test their intelligence and common sense skills. If you've ever been an intern, you know what that feels like. As people, we love the ending to a great story where individuals come out on top after their hardships. Think about the movies and the books and the songs that are written that are based off of true stories. And you know when you're watching a movie and it says at the bottom, based off a true story, you know it's about to get real. Because we love... We love when we, face th- when we see people face things and they go through things and they come out on top. And as unbelievers, hard times are something that you have to just figure out because you don't have a God to guide you. And they can be very confusing. Some of us have been there before we came to Christ, before Christ was able to deliver us. How many times of desperation did you, did you face trying to figure out what was going on? Just recently, I was with a group of about 100 people, and we're sitting at different round tables. And part of the training that I was part of included each person sharing their life stories and how their trials and hardships they had gone through gave them their why. This is why I do what I do, because I've gone through this. And my experiences... And that's why I think this way, and that's how I act this way, and that's why I do this. I heard a term that I've heard a lot of times, and that term was, my coping mechanism was this. 
And you would have to fill in the blanks to what that coping mechanism might be. People use different things. And if you're wondering if I got to share my faith, I didn't. Because we ran out of time. And a lot of people that I was sitting with, they, they did not know Christ, but a lot of them know the testimony of the faith that I have in him. And I was waiting. I was just waiting. I was jonesing. Because there's only one true. He's not even a coping mechanism. He's God. And although there's times that I may disagree with what he's doing, he's still God. And he knows what he's doing. And so, those who do not know God do everything opposite of what God would have them to do. We know that the Word of God teaches us in Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. The world does opposite. The world trusts in anything but the Lord with their whole hearts. Leaning on their own understanding, not acknowledging him, even though it may claim to. But they don't acknowledge him according to his word. And it leads to paths that are not straight. It's a confusing time if you don't have the Lord. You want to do what's right in your own eyes. You don't want to trust God when you don't have him, because how can you? You're born dead in trespasses. Everything leads to the most important thing, which is yourself. And this is very dangerous for the unbeliever, because as they go through things, it causes the unbeliever, as they get through them, to become self-righteous, because look what I've done for myself. You hear things like, nobody was there for me. I got through it all by myself. Me, 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 me. My self-righteousness comes from me thinking about the things that I got myself through. But after a person is regenerated, the believer learns God is the only one that they can turn to in times of need. And we learn real quick that the rules of the world, they do not cross over to God. Certain situations now have to be looked through the lens of Scripture. There's no way that we can say that the Word of God has full authority over our lives unless we truly practice that. And for some of us, we learn this faster than others. And for some, we're so hard-headed. And stubborn, it takes a while. I'm right there with you if you're a little slow on trusting the Lord. Has anyone ever said, I can help God out if I just do this? We're a tag team, God. You can get me through this. Just tag me in. I'm right there. Tag me, God. Tag me. Tag me. Get me in. God ain't going to tag you in. He knows what he's doing. See, the term father becomes also real in the life of the believer. And since father knows best, we have to learn and trust in him through troubling times. And as believers, it should not surprise us that even as children of God, we will have trouble. It doesn't just go away because all of a sudden you get regenerated. Sometimes it gets worse because God is on a, on a mission to glorify himself, and he does. He does. There is no pass. You can't say when trouble times come, do you know who my dad is? I'm a child of God. That doesn't work. Your troubles will tell you God sent me. Your daddy sent me. John 16, 33, Jesus tells the disciples, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Hard times, they serve a purpose in our lives. And because of who Christ is, we have peace through tribulation. And the disciples would need that peace. 
as all of them would go on to give their lives for this glorious gospel. Romans 5, 3 and 4 says, And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And we know that this hope does not disappoint. Who's excited to exalt in their tribulations? I don't know one person. But at the end of the process, when you have proven character and you have hope in God, you understand that your troubled times serve a purpose. Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things. James 1, 2 through 4, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. This is not always, not always easy to see the good in troubling times. When we look at it through the lens of self, what have you gone through? What are you possibly going through now? Every situation is different. I learned when I first came to the faith, somebody told me this, and I don't know how accurate it is, but it's always stuck with me. Either you're going into a, a trial You're in a trial or you're coming out of a trial. So that I could expect hard times. Some of us face sickness. Some of us face the blues. Separation. When your life falls apart and you got no answers, but you know God's finger is pressing on you. There's a peace that you have, but you don't understand. What about your family when your family's going through it? When your spouse or your children? It seems like in my house, either my wife or myself have always been in troubling times. And we're always there through God's grace to have each other's back. And it's hard, especially when you don't have an answer for your spouse. Or they don't have an answer for you. My wife will tell you, I just had to trust God through that crazy season he was going through and pray for him. And I've had to do the same. The hugs, the holding, the prayer, because it affects you. And you care. You wish you could trade places when your kids suffer. We hate to see our own children suffer. We hate when they're going through the fire. It bothers us. And you're helpless at times to do anything. You can't help God. God's at work, and your kids have to be entrusted to him. That's hard. What about the body? When we go through the fire together, and we have each other, We love each other. That's what separates the body of Christ from anything else. You shall know them by their love for one another. You hear one of your blessed brothers and sisters are going through something. And you say, what can I do? And they say, just pray. I feel your prayers. There's been times I've been guilty of like trying to have an answer. This is why God is doing this. Have you ever walked away and you say, I don't know how you're going to get them through this one, God. Please keep them. 
please keep them because we go through the fire. But praise the Lord, we have each other. Best thing to do is anytime you get an alert on the prayer chain, just pray right there. And what about the world? As we share life with unbelievers, we do our best to point them to Christ. And until they come to him, we carry burdens of compassion for them. You only have one answer for them. You need Christ. And that answer is not because of what you're going through right now. It's because you need to be at peace with your maker and you have sin. I'm not telling you that if you come to Christ, your troubles will go away. But I am telling you, if you come to Christ, you will have peace with God. But until then, it is such a hard task to be around them. My wife and I were lucky to to do certain uh, unique ministry. And one of the hardest things that I have to do is drop people off and say, trust God through this situation. You got to trust him. I don't know what else to tell you. And you feel helpless. But God takes care of his own. And we see the world goes crazy and it puts its trust in different things, different ideas. Scared. Afraid of the craziest things. And the child of God has peace at night. And though we as believers, we don't fully understand or see how God is at work behind the scenes. He does something through us or to us, and that is he gives us his word to guide us through whatever we're going through. Many have faced hard times throughout the scripture. Joseph, Job, Isaiah, Ruth and Naomi, the disciples, to name a few. And there's many more. Throughout the history of the church, individuals like Polycarp, John Huss, the reformers, John Bunyan, and even today, as our brothers and sisters in the faith, lose their lives for the gospel and are treated harshly throughout the world. And this is why the Psalms are so powerful for us. Because they give us hope. One writer said the Psalms are diverse. And since the Psalms deal with such subjects as God and his creation, war, worship, wisdom, sin, and evil, judgment, justice, And my favorite, especially the coming of the Messiah. The Psalms renew and restore a crushed heart. The Psalms are relevant and applicable as they contain the highs and the lows of human experience, the victories and defeat in human life, the mountaintops and the valleys of one's spiritual journey. From the pinnacle of praise to the pit of despair, the full spectrum of human emotions is captured and communicated in this book. That's Steve Lawson. When we read the Psalms with faith, we come away changed and not simply informed. It is said that the Psalms dramatically emboldened Martin Luther to boldly proclaim proclaim the message, God's message to the world. Romans gave Luther his theology, but the Psalms gave him his thunder. And throughout the centuries, countless believers have turned to the unfailing, unchanging truths of the Psalms as they have become their greatest source of strength in hours of difficulty. What the Psalms do for me personally is they show me how to get through the different seasons that God has taken me through. It seems there's a psalm for every season. And in faith, and most importantly, they show me how I ought to love God and his word. And they point to Christ. The psalms also require a particular study when reading in context because they were written during the Mosaic covenant. And we now live under the new covenant, meaning there are certain privileges that we have concerning the law and grace. And therefore, we must study them with the author's view and apply them to our lives through a different lens. David was looking for what we now have. What a privilege. And particularly looking at Psalm 27, 
We must look through the life and the eyes of David, a man described as the sweet psalmist of Israel in Scripture. And he's credited for penning Psalm 27. And as you read about David in Scripture in detail, you cannot help but to see many hard times, sometimes self-inflicted, calling for discipline from the Lord, and other times dealing with his life through unexpected hardships. And David truly was a man that walked in the valley of the shadow of death. I look up to this brother. I personally would be trying to run through the valley of the shadow of death. And he just dwelt in it. He understood. And he was able to walk because he knew his shepherd. I love how the Psalms can be paralleled with other books in the Bible. As you explore scripture, you can read Psalms 3 and learn that David is, is penning that with his, battle, his struggles with his son Absalom, Psalm 51, as he's repenting, just to name a few. But in regard to 27, we don't have a definite parallel, but from different commentaries that I have read, we more than likely can put Psalm 27 in parallel with, Psalm 20, or with 1 Samuel 22 and 23. And so, I want to do a quick, brief survey of David's relationship with Saul. Things were going good for Saul. And Saul was rejected as king of Israel by God. And as the kingdom was torn for him and given to his neighbor who was better than him, Saul heard for himself from Samuel. His, his replacement would be David. After everything's going good, disobedient, now your kingdom is taken from you. Not at that very moment, but it was coming. And David was chosen by God, and he was anointed as the next king. And as soon as he was anointed, the Spirit of the Lord would come mightily upon him from the day that he was chosen. And Saul becomes terrorized by an evil spirit from the Lord. And David would come play his harp with Saul, and the evil spirit would depart. And this is what's, what's so heavy to me. Is Saul is described by Scripture as loving David greatly, and he even made him his armor bearer. This is a man that loved David. Saul watches David kill Goliath, and in the conversation that he has with his son Jonathan, he even rejoices. Saul keeps David full time from his household, and Jonathan. His son and David become very close. They even make covenants. And David would serve Saul and God would prosper him. And Saul set David over the men of war in Israel. And this was pleasing to everybody. God was making fame for David. And as David returned from battle, the battle songs would be sang by women in the cities of Israel saying, Saul has killed his thousands. And David, his ten thousands, which made Saul angry, and he despised, was displeased by him. And from that day on, this relationship that Saul had with David was looked on from suspicion on Saul's end. Remember, Saul loved him, and he didn't just love him, he loved him greatly. And because of his feelings, his new feelings towards David... He tries to kill him. And, and throughout Scripture, throughout Samuel, we just see how Saul pursues David. And David did nothing to deserve this. To make matters worse, Saul's daughter, Michal, she loves David. And so, Saul, and so Saul has an idea. I'm going to use my daughter to get him killed. In order for you to marry my daughter, I'll require... 100 foreskins from a Philistine. What does David do? Comes back with 200. Saul's plan backfires. He's really out to get David. And David asks Jonathan, he says, what have I done? What is my sin that he would pursue my life? And this is all found in the book of 1 Samuel. And so we'll pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 22. And this is Saul speaking. As he's pursuing David, he says, go now, make sure 
make more sure and investigate and see this pla- his place where he is, hot, where his hot is. And who has seen him there? For I am told that he is very cunning, speaking of David. So look and learn about all the hiding places where he hides himself. And return to me with certainty. And I will go with you. And if he is in the land, I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. Then they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon and Arabah to the south of Jeshimon. When Saul and his men went to seek him, they told David, and he came down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Moan. And when Saul heard it, he pursued David in the wilderness of Moan. Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men were on the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul. For Saul and his men were surrounding David and his men to seize them. But a messenger came from Saul saying, please, saying, hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid on the land. So Saul returned from pursuing David and went to meet the Philistines. Therefore, they called the place the Rock of Escape. David went up, and there he stayed in the strongholds of Engedi. See, in what light of we just read, we can look at Psalm 27. The psalm presents a strong desire to live in the presence of God, and it points to the ongoing need for believers to continue to wait on the Lord. So very quickly, I'll give you four things that we can take away from Psalm 27. The first thing we can take away is David's confidence in God. Going back to to Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of all this, I shall be confident. David would have been familiar with darkness. I know we have some of our gentlemen who are camping right now. And the few times that I have been camping, I've learned what darkness is coming from the city. You can't even see your hand in front of you. David would have been in the shepherd field, in the darkness. He would have been in caves hiding from Saul and his men. Not only that, but he would have some dark times emotionally because of some of the things that he caused through his own actions. And so when David says, the Lord is my light and my salvation... What's amazing about this statement is it becomes personal because there's a my attached to it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. To say, whom shall I fear, is a bold statement because at the time, men were in pursuit of his life. And he was also the leader of his men. It's easy for us as believers to say, whom shall I fear or what shall I dread when we're not being pursued? When times of trouble do not exist, but when they become present, can we still say the same thing? The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. Anybody can say, God got this when you're on that, when you're on the sidelines. But when you're in the game and things are are not going as they ought to go in your opinion, can you still say the Lord is my light and my salvation? There's a certain confidence that David had in God. Only a person whose light and salvation has defense for his life can walk to the middle of a battlefield and slay a giant with a sling and no armor. We can really see that David feared nothing. It is not merely, not said merely that the Lord gives light, this is Spurgeon, but that he is light nor that he gives salvation, but that he is salvation. He then who by faith has laid upon God has all covenant blessings in his salvation. And we can look to God through Jesus Christ. And as believers, we have a Lord who is our light and our salvation. That Lord being Jesus Christ. If you put 
even a portion of confidence in anything other than Jesus, you may need to realign your understanding of the gospel. There could be no confidence in anything other than God himself. He alone is worthy of full confidence. And we need God to take us to where we have to go in our understanding of who he is so that we understand this. Number two, David's love for communion with God. Verses four through six. One thing that I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me on a rock. And now my head will be lifted above my enemies around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. And I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. We just seen how God delivered David in the book of Samuel. It's looking grim for David. Real grim. Can you imagine your enemies getting ready to surround you on the other side of a mountain? And it wasn't a fair game. David had 400, and Saul had many from the land of Judah. And they're pursuing David probably more than the movie <laughs> that, I, that I've seen before. Uh, what's it called? Um, where they rob tra- uh, trains. And they get caught. And they start pursuing them through the mountains. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. There we go. <laughs> and they're having a good time. And then all of a sudden, these men start tracking them. And there is no rest. I imagine David being the same thing. But the men that are tracking Butch, Butch Cassidy and Sundance... There's only a few. We're talking about so many men tracking David and his men. And just as they're getting ready to surround the mountain and overtake him, who delivers him? God. The Bible says that he would not give him over to Saul. And the beauty of this is that David had an unshakable confidence in God. So much that David looked upon God other than his circumstances He did not look at his circumstances, something that I would do. When I'm going through hard times, I must confess there's been times that I've said, God, I want to get out of this. What do we do here? And instead of looking at his beauty, I look to the solution, knowing that he's the true solution. And this, whatever David was going through would cause him to want to dwell with God. And so he even says, O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells, as Pastor Robert read. David loves God's house. He loves the tabernacle. He sees it as the priests are ministering eventually. He wants to build a temple. He finds value in what he's going through because he sees the value of God. And so it causes him to take action. One thing I will seek. We, Spurgeon said this, we shall find our desires to be like clouds without rain unless followed up by practical endeavors. David could not help but to let praises fall from his lips. He wanted to see the beauty of God. And one of these days as believers, we will see God's beauty. We can't be in a place forever where we have to imagine what it will look like described in God's word. But there will come a time when we will see him face to face. And it will be the most beautiful thing that we've ever hoped for. You see, in Christ, we have a better hope through which we draw near to God because we draw near to God through Jesus Because he now appears in the presence of God for us, we are guaranteed a seat at the table if we are found in him. David understood this. Number three, David's prayer to God. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice and be gracious to me and answer me. 
When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me, nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such breathe out violence. We look at the intimacy that David has with the Lord. And when you're going through hard times, it's important for the child of God to pour out his heart to the Lord. I've learned that when I go through hard times, there's sometimes I'm like, God knows what's going on. I don't got to say anything. But there's so much refreshment to speaking to the Lord about what I'm going through in detail. And let God know how I truly feel. So if you ever face hard times, I would encourage you to talk to God about what you're going through. I love in verse 9, David knows the experience that God has been his help. He can look back to the lion. He can look back to the bear. He can look back to Goliath. You see, when you go through certain hardships, you can be like David and know that God is faithful. And last but not least, David's exhortion, number four, David's exhortion for us to wait on God, verses 13 and 14. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. The psalm concludes on a triumphant note. In spite of difficulties, the royal psalmist leads his people into a deeper faith. He is strongly convinced that the Lord will come to the rescue of his people. Spurgeon once again says, wait at his door with prayer. Wait at his foot with humility. Wait at his table with service. Wait at his window with expectancy. David declares his personal trust in the Lord. And to wait on the Lord, what does that mean? It means to attach yourself to God. Preparing to not move unless God moves. Fasten yourself to God. Whatever you're going through this morning, you have to give it to God. You have to trust him. You've got to wait on him. You'll make a bigger mess out of the situation. Trust me, I've tried. I know it takes courage to wait on God because there's no timetable for God. God does not have to answer to us and give us a timetable when he's going to be done taking us through hard times. He's not an American. Time is money, not to God. We have to just trust that he knows what he's doing under his own circumstances, under his timetable. You can't help him. All you can do is hope to have the same experience that David has. I want to see your beauty. I want to know who you truly are, God. We've all gone through these. And trust me, if you haven't yet, you will. It's really frustrating. It's like trying to unlock a puzzle. Figure it out. We want answers. I've, had, I've, I've been impatient with God. God, I just want answers so I can figure out what you're trying to put me through so I can learn this lesson and fast forward and just kind of get through what you're trying to go. I'm ready to learn. And I learned that I was on his time. Man, all of us could come up and share about the hardships that we've gone through. Sometimes it's years. Sometimes it's weeks. But we have to see the beauty of God. Because when we're done going through what we're going through, you will have an entirely different view of God than when you first started. And you will have experience to take you through what you've got to go through. So in conclusion... What we can take away is God always knows what he's doing so we can be confident in him. And his beauty shines brighter than the hard times that we go through. And we are to wait on him in all things. 
Praise God. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for Psalm 27. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God that helps us see the truth of when we go through hard times, that you set us on a rock, that you give us, Lord, the advantage over our enemies, Lord. At one time, we were your enemy, God. We pursued everything else but you. And yet, Lord, in your grace and your mercy, you saved your enemies. And now, God, we must be taught to see your beauty, to want to dwell in your house, to meditate on you, to share our heart before you, O oh God. You know everything, but there's a certain intimacy that you give us, Lord. And you cause us to have holy affections towards you, O oh Lord. And you've given us your word to guide us, to show us, to see your beauty rather than focus on the things that we ought not to focus on. And we see, Lord, that we can wait on you. We can trust you. We look to Christ, our deliverer. He's made peace, Lord, for us. We thank you for his sacrifice. And as the future comes, Lord God, we're able to dwell in the Holy of Holies. We thank you, Lord, that we can see this beauty, that we're part of this kingdom, that we've been restored, that we're no longer in Adam, God, but we're in Christ. Help us to always trust you, Lord. Let us never sway. Never let us look to other things, Lord. Or try and figure out what you're doing, but let us rest in who you are to see you, God, the way you ought to be seen. We thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen.